Thanks, Joseph. I have to come prepared. I need to untop my water bottle. And while I'm doing that, I'd like to point out to you that I'm the only really genuine TED talk tonight. <laughs> I would like to follow up on the theme of the speaker in that video. I'm going to tell you something tonight that you may not want to know, but something that you really need to know. I'm going to talk to you about human behaviour. And why is that important to us? Well, by and large, human beings have four sets of needs. Uh, and before I go any further, let me also acknowledge that some of the precepts that I'm talking about tonight were originally articulated by my good friend and colleague, the uh, uh, Dr. Phil Harker, the good Dr. Phil, as I often call him. Now, human beings have these four sets of needs. We have our physical needs, we have our social needs, we have our intellectual needs, and we also have spiritual needs. And if we don't meet our physical needs, we die. And if we don't meet our uh, social needs, we die emotionally and sometimes physically as well. And most of what I'm talking about tonight is really about our social needs. And these are very important to us. If you think about your own lives, uh, a whole lot of the, I suppose, the, uh, uh, the joy that you get from them uh, come from the social relationships that you have. And to have those social relationships, we need to interact with other human beings. And to interact with other human beings, we have to have some understanding about human behaviour. And most of us have our notions about human behaviour. And these notions are built on some assumptions and beliefs that we hardly ever challenge. And tonight I want to challenge a couple of them for you. Here's a, uh, a model of human behaviour. Why, why do people behave the way they do? I probably need to give you a note of explanation does anybody like to guess what a BBP is? No, uh, no. Well, it's a badly behaving person. <laughs> and it seems most of us are obsessed on trying to explain away bad behaviour than understanding good behaviour. So we'll look at a badly behaving person. A lot of the scientific literature over the years was devoted to this debate between nature and nurture. Well, I'm here to tell you that both nature and nurture have a part to play in the foundations of human behaviour. The first factor on the right there that impacts on our human behaviour is our biological history. You know, um, our brains are, are very composite. Paul McLean, way back in the mid-1960s, talked about the triune brain. He talked about uh, our brain falling into three parts. The inner part, which comprised the brain stem and the amygdala, is what he called the reptilian brain, because reptiles, that's all the brain that they've got. And yet, I mean, they live you know, reasonable lives just with that amount of brain. On top of that was what he called the, uh, the paleomammalian brain, which is the part of our brain that we share with other mammals. And from that we actually get other things, uh, but probably most importantly in the context of what I'm talking about tonight is our emotions. Reptiles don't have emotions, mammals do. And sitting on the top, which is the one that we make the big fuss about, our cerebral cortex, he called that the neo-mammalian brain. And that's what gives us the capacity to reason and probably if you're um, uh, looking at the uh, evolution of brain over the last 100,000 years or so, it's probably what we would uh, conclude most of our notions of consciousness come from. So in, locked in that brain are instincts that we've inherited from our ancestors well beyond the stage that we are hominids. You know, so for example, I suppose many of you will have an instinctual fear of um, 
Snakes and spiders, would that be right? Yeah. yeah. Do you know any people that have been killed by snakes and spiders? But when you we are hunter gatherers, that was quite a useful set of instincts to have. Right now, we'd be better off if we had some instinctual fear for speeding motor vehicles and electric light sockets and things like that. So our brains haven't actually evolved to uh, fit themselves to modern conditions. So we've got some instincts there that actually cause us to behave in certain ways that are beyond our consciousness. And it's easy to see uh, how genetics impacts on um, our behaviours. Um, the, the lady speaking before the break, I, gave, I guess, gave you some indications that men behave differently to women. And that's a genetic thing. So, I mean, do you believe that men behave differently to women? Most people do. I can tell you that, by and large, men murder probably seven times more frequently than women do. Men die in uh, car crashes involving speed about five times more frequently than women do. Now, you might say, is it likely that men just choose to do that? Well, of course not. I mean, it's the impact of their genetics and particularly testosterone. And, and by the time uh, males are in their early 20s, you can already start to see some of the impacts of that on their mortality. You mightn't think that that's a very good evolutionary strategy. So, so men sort of uh, kill themselves off more frequently. So how does that work? Well, you women are to blame because women, <laughs> you, women, women don't like wimps. So it pays off for men to shoulder off, or elbow off a few competitors, take a few risks, and as a result, they get to mate more often. And that is what embeds the genetic uh, traits. Another really good example I came across some years ago, there was a, a study done by a paediatrician in, uh, in New York. His name was Perry Brazelton. One of his friends was a psychologist. Uh, his name was Daniel Friedman. And he married a Cantonese Chinese lady. And th this couple were really intrigued by the differences in the behaviour of the children on both sides of their families. So Brazelton devised some very simple exper experiments. And uh, they took a cohort of of uh, Cantonese Chinese uh, children under the age of, under the 33 hour, three hours old, so less than 33 hours old, they had little chance to learn anything. So any of the behaviour that you're likely to observe would be genetically inherited. And they took a cohort of the uh, typical European babies. And they found quite conclusively that the Chinese babies uh, were more placid, if you put them in an uncomfortable position, they didn't complain so much. If they uh, were faster, well, they were easier to settle and so on. So it's quite easy to see that there's some genetic traits that we all acquire that are far beyond our conscious determination. Now, an evolutionary event that made a whole lot of difference to how humans um, have evolved was actually when our ancestors came down from the trees and learned to walk. When they did that, it caused a skeletal change in humans, and in particular, it narrowed the birth canal for women. The evolutionary response to that was to have our children born more immaturely. So when a wildebeest gives birth to a calf out in the Serengeti Plain, Unless it's up and running in an hour or two, it's going to be a lion's dinner. Our kids, you know, they, they're dependent on us, on us for ages. I can vouch for, in my case, at least 40 years. <laughs> so, but that actually gave us something. When our children were then being born more immaturely, they actually had less brain capacity tied up in that genetic inheritance and more that was available for learning. So through social learning, we learn other behaviours. And that comes back to this notion again of our, our social needs. 
because we want some sense of affiliation and belonging and so on and so forth, uh, we tend to conform to the behaviour that significant others demand of us. When our children are very small, we give them care with no regard for anything, which is a really amazing thing when you have a look at these little crumpled, vociferous, incontinent creatures, <laughs> which you would think would be hard to love, but we all do. <laughs> but give them a year or two, and all of a sudden, we're starting to be more concerned about their meeting the needs of the caregivers than of us meeting their needs, and they start to conform to our needs. And that happens all the way through our lives. Once you uh, leave home, there's your peer group and so on and so forth. So we socialise a lot of behaviours. And those two things, our social history and our genetic and biological history, are actually cumulative, so that they reinforce each other. For example, if you belong to criminal parents, and I'm sure none of you do, and you live in a criminal environment, then you're much more likely to be a criminal. And if you remove one of those, it's, it's less. So in our heads, we have this whole lot of um, what I would call behavioural subroutines that have come from our genetics and come from our socialisation, and yet we believe that we actually choose our behaviours. The famous neurologist Robert Ornstein calls the the mind, a squadron of simpletons. A squadron of, of simpletons. And he gave a great example once of a friend of his who was a psychiatrist, and he's treating this uh, paranoid schizophrenic who they, for anonymity's sake, called Alfred. And um, the psychiatrist gets a uh, call from the police one day. Alfred has gone up to the scenic lookout on the outskirts of town and has climbed over the barrier and is threatening to jump off. So the psychiatrist goes up and uses all his great cogn cognitive behavioural therapies and everything else, but he has no success. And he goes away and leaves the man in the care of the police negotiators. Now, unknown to him, another policeman arrives on the scene and, and is, is unaware of the fact that this sort of little tragedy is about to take place. And he gets on his bullhorn, this is in America, and says, would whoever illegally parked this blue Pontiac please come and shift it? And Alfred climbed back over the wall and shifted his blue Pontiac. So what's happened here is the, you know, the subroutine of the suicidal um, you know, person was suddenly overridden by the subroutine of the law-abiding citizen. So you can't really imagine that somebody that was making a rational decision about committing suicide would be worried about a parking ticket. No. So we have all these subroutines in our heads and we are then uh, impacted on by our, our environment. So we have situational demands. So when something happens to us, whatever it is, you know, you're reading a book, you're discussing something with a colleague, you fall over, we have to make some response and we automatically take down from our subroutines the one that we've learned to use in those circumstances and we apply it. But we think we consciously made that decision because the mind is not rational, it's actually rationalising. It gives us a reason why we behaved the way we did even though we actually did that quite automatically. So that's how to explain our bad behaving person. It's not that we don't have any choice. We do have choice through free will, but it's not the time or place to go through that with you. I'm just saying to you, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, we don't choose our behaviour. So the myth that uh, I wanted to spell, first of all, is that human beings have free will and therefore freely and consciously choose their own actions and reactions as they respond to their world. Now, there is another myth. And it's this one. How we feel and how we react is caused by what has happened to us. That's a natural thing to think because in many of our life circumstances we get the notion of a, a stimulus and a response. So we get a stimulus and that follows up with a response. So we think something happens and that causes our behaviour. But there's a whole array of behaviours that aren't caused that way at all. These behaviours are called get my way behaviours because they are more easily understood not by what happened before but by what happens after. 
we actually behave in this way to manipulate other people. The after effect, not because of what stimulated the first. You know, for example, if you insult me and I take great offence, what's happening here? Did your insult cause my offence? No, no. My internal well-being is entirely my own uh, domain. You can't impact on it. But if I make a big fuss about it, and I make you feel guilty about your behaviour, you're less likely to do that to me again. You know, if you do something trivial and I get angry, well, I frighten you and you're not likely to do that again. And we learn these things in our early childhood. And, uh, you know, as parents, we often unfortunately reinforce these things. When we come home from school, your mother says, oh, Ted, I'm so ashamed, you know, you never bring your kids home, your friends home or I was so disappointed, you know, you didn't do well at school. So all of a sudden, her feelings are my problem. And that's not the case at all. So if you could learn, teach your children that how they feel about themselves is largely their province of control and not yours, that would be a good lesson. So what I'm suggesting to you is that we utilise these get my way behaviours to manipulate other people because of what happens after the behaviour and not from what comes before. And there's a paradox here. As I've said here, you know, when you do something that I find offensive, uh, I, I believe that you were actually, uh, did your stuff intentionally and it was all under your control, yet my behaviour in response, I believe was your fault as well. <laughs> Huh? But that's not rational, is it? And in behaviour, it's, it's the intent that matters. We don't blame people for their bodily actions. We, bl we blame them for their intent. To give you a trivial example, if um, I'm queuing up to get a ticket to the theatre uh, on the footpath and I get a sharp shove in the back, how do I feel? Well, I probably feel a bit under attack. I might feel angry. And when I turn around, What's happened is a little old lady slipped over on the footpath and has pushed me on the way down. Well, how do I feel then? Well, I feel more concerned for her than I do for me. So obviously my response was more determined by the intent that I impugned behind the behaviour than behaviour itself. And Philip Zimbardo, the great American psychologist says, you know, the greatest flaw in all our thinking is the attribution of intent. So there you go, there's a couple of um, myths about human behaviour that I hope you might find useful to use. If you actually understand uh, behaviour in this way, you'll find uh, you'll be more tolerant of the people around you and hopefully you'll have more constructive relationships. Thank you.